So let's go ahead and finish this up. By the way, what is happening today in the United States? What? And what's Super Tuesday besides being an awesome day? What's Super Tuesday mean? <coughs> yeah, in the primaries, so there's got a couple caucuses, which are a little bit more time consuming. But yeah, we have many southern states and a few northerners who are the primaries or caucuses for the nominees for Democratic and Republican nomination. And this is kind of a big one because there's a good chance that one Republican will sweep all of them. And if he does, he's very much along the way to be the nominee. Boom. Boom. Trump. Which is, uh, we've gone to almost uh, a surreal world where we have we have a reality television star. I don't think he is a reality television star. Going to become president. Maybe that's what we need. And they've now devolved, the debate has devolved to the to uh, junior high insults. If you don't believe me, I'm not, I can't even tell you what some of them are. They're like, you got to be kidding me. The Democrats, which are, it's, it's like a different world watching the Democrats debate. And the Democrats, one might take a pretty good lead, but it still could be close. Who might take a pretty good lead? Huh? Probably not. Yeah, probably Clinton. Clinton, very good chance that she's going to, but but if Sanders wins in a couple states and when they're in the primaries go back north, he still has a shot, but he's got to win in a few states. He's got to win in five states. If he doesn't win in five of his well, he's probably pretty close to being done. And so we might get a Democratic now, or it looks like a front runner, a clear front runner for the Democratic nomination. Yeah. How many states This one's 12. Was it 12 Democratic and 13 Republican? I think it is. Montana doesn't go until the first Tuesday in June. And unless it's unbelievably close, like it was in 2008, we won't. We won't see any Democrats, is my, my guess. Maybe Democrats for president. And maybe Republicans. I, don't, I have no idea what's going to happen at that point. I, the Democratic Party leads, I think there's a, there's a cohesion there. Yeah. All right, so we went through the different reasons why imperialism, and first one, what was it? They wanted to expand, make new what? Yeah, markets. Not only just for them to buy their surplus, which never happened, but also they would provide what? And what does that relate to what policy? It goes back to Louis XIV. Mercantilism. Very good. And that's another example of synthesis. That's a really good synthesis. Next was the philosophy that said, White man's burden and um, should be, and Europeans are on top. It's our, it's the duty of Europeans to conquer and colonize. Yeah, social. I had social law. What is on over here? What's the the next one? What is? I didn't think. Who wrote the book? Need a military basis. Who wrote the book? Influence the sea power. Yeah, John. yeah. Alfred Thayer Mahan. And then we got to, what was the last one we got to? Did we get to? So we got to European superiority and social Darwinism. Did we get to? Was what? Yeah, White Man's Burden. Who wrote the poem for White Man's Burden? Did I mention that? Yeah, Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard Kipling, who has become like the patron saint of this, of colonialism. Shoot. I went to start the projector and I shut off glass and pictures on the show of my childhood growing up. And everybody's going to get involved in this new imperialism. And I just put this up because I thought this is a great cartoon of Germans in Southwest Africa. I'm still trying to figure this out, what it means, but as far as I could guess, it's goose stepping giraffe and they're muzzling the gator of. Of Africa, I don't know. It. All I got to say is this. It's awesome. That is the greatest cartoon ever. 
Now, before we get to that, that gets to number five, the last reason for this. And the only way to describe this is prestige. Prestige. Once one country started getting an empire, everybody else wanted an empire. We look great if we have an empire. Britain has this big empire and they're powerful. We want our own empires. So everyone got that. Prestige. And everyone's going to be in competition. We want to get there before somebody else gets there. You know, the, the Brits were desperate, for example, to get Uganda before the French got there. There'd be a fight for the for the source of the Nile River. If they if the French get it, Britain will be weak, and vice versa. They're fighting for these territories. And one big element is going to be this idea of prestige will be Germany. Germany, and this is why I have this up here, they're gonna say, okay, if France wants a colony, we want one too. This will weaken France. Bismarck could have cared less about colonies. But in the 1870s, all of a sudden he's like, wow, we can make France feel bad. <laughs> and so they started wanting colonies, for example, like the Cameroons, one of the colonies you did on your map. Germany had no real vested interest except to keep French out. And so this is all part of the prestige. And then add one more thing, real politique. It's real politique then. We'll do whatever it takes to increase our the power of our country, and therefore we will get colonies and we will show our superiority. And so here is a map of the world by 1900, and almost all the world will be colonized. Now we're going to focus on Africa. We will do a little bit of China and India, talk about the Opium Wars, etc., just very quickly. But you're going to have British colonies and islands all over the Pacific, eventually German. Here are Belgium will get colonies, the massive French colonies, etc. On oh, the Dutch still have this. This was the Dutch East, East India Company during, during the Napoleonic Wars and went bankrupt with the Dutch East Indies. And so huge colonies all over the world. I'm going to skip forward just a little bit. Oh, I don't want opium wars. Is this the wrong one? Sorry. We don't want opium. Everybody, opium bad. And so let's do the scramble for Africa. And then somebody did with little caricatures of all the European characters. You know, you can just look at it and tell exactly who there are. Germany in the suit, Belgium is King Leopold, and the French with a looking with this kind of a small, weird looking beard. And of course, Italy with the, the rakish mustache. You know it's Italy. And this is the possessions in Europe at approximately European possessions at approximately 1870. And what this shows, these arrows are showing the expansion into the interior of what they call, so we write down the scramble route, we write down, up until about the 1850s, it was called the Dark Pond. It wasn't called Dark Pond, it was called Dark Pond because they didn't know the interior, they didn't map it. And one of the first real big things is, who can go in and explore and get a claim? Yeah. No, that, this is new, it's just the scramble, we're gonna talk about what happened with the scramble for Africa. The Dark Continent. There were a few areas that were very important for trade. We already mentioned palm oil and Sierra Leone, and it's going to be the Gold Coast, but eventually it's going to be Ghana. And Cape Colony was a very important colony. Egypt was actually part of the Ottoman Empire, even though as a sick man in Europe was in decline. Egypt was kind of quasi independent. Actually, the same with Tripoli, which is now. Actually, about four different big travel areas, which is now Libya, which is part of the reason why it's in chaos now. Algeria. It's, these were all places that various European powers felt they had an interest. But to get started, oh, there it is. Remember I mentioned Dr. Livingston and his missionary work? Who met Livingston? Who was the newspaper reporter who would trigger this and become the most famous African explorer and I would argue morally degenerate person? Yeah, Henry Stanley. 
So this is Stanley when he met Livingston, and then you have this combination, therefore, of the missionary works bringing civilization, and Stanley, who would bring commerce. And so there is Stanley. And to get started with imperialism, we have to get started here with them. Stanley searched the interior of Africa. He went there at first working for Livingston, and then would go for a couple other reasons, but one of them was for King Leopold II. Leopold II Leopold II, the new king of Belgium, remember Belgium was created back in 1830, a small multicultural kingdom, this French and Dutch who lived there, and Leopold was incredibly ambitious, incredibly, and he funded Stanley's expedition up the Congo River. Now, the Congo River is, would become the great source of mystery within Africa. Here's the Congo River. And the reason why is, if you sail down the coast, here, you can't see the mouth. It is as filled with reeds. It is a delta. In fact, it was almost impossible to get via water up the Congo River from the ocean. Couldn't see it. It was a delta that was basically mangrove um, forts. And then there's a series of waterfalls and cataracts right here, big elevation shift. It's really hard to get here. But then, if you got past where the rapids are, it's a over a mile wide river that they thought saw, saw, they heard it was in the ocean, or this uh, highway into Africa and the untold riches of Africa. Leopold paid for Stanley to go around the delta and make a trail around the delta and the, and the uh, cataracts, rapids, and get to this and create trading posts. And what did he want? Leopold wanted trading posts for ivory before anybody else got them. Leopold had a plan. Leopold knew that the other countries in Africa were gearing up to explore, gearing up to conquer parts of Africa. It's already rumbling. In England, there's talk of expanding their empire. In France, they're already intriguing. In North Africa, Algeria. You can imagine, just by looking at this map, Here's France, here's Algeria. France always saw Algeria as in their sphere of influence. So they're already intriguing. And so Leopold wants to say, I will bring civilization, commerce, and Christianity. Did you catch that? The three C's. Civilization, commerce, and Christianity to Africa. I will do it not in co imperialistic competition, but for the betterment of society. He thought, I can get there first. I could lay a claim to this civilizing task and claim it will avoid the competition between imperial powers that might lead to war, but he gets the wealth. And if you look at this, the Congo is a massive river that goes all the way here and then there's another, there's three other big rivers that go. Paper, yes. Now Hillary, Hillary Clinton has a very good shot. I would argue, right now at the moment, she has the best shot of anybody to become the next president of the United States. And here she is celebrating. And I thought this just isn't a good. <laughs> she's like, yeah, like she's raining blows onto somebody's stall. Maybe that is a good picture. Maybe that's what the people want. Somebody who is beating somebody at that moment. I just think that's kind of a funny picture. But whatever. Go, yeah! Somebody happened to catch it. That's funny. Let's show that picture of her. Now, I think she has a very good shot. But you never know. Our campaign season is too long. 
there. I'm in a value judgment. Well, into the Congo. And what happened was Leopold knew if I could get this, and this is going to lead to the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885. The Berlin Conference. This is going to be the second such conference. And that is the Berlin, oh, that's the wrong conference. That's 1778. We're getting that next. Here it is. The Berlin Conference of 1784. And what the Berlin Conference was, this was Bismarck's idea. Bismarck, and this fits back in just a little bit of synthesis, that Congress system that happened after the Napoleonic Wars, where the great powers thought they could come together to form some kind of agreement before it went to full-out war. And Leopold dominated this. Leopold dominated this conference that was going to be, to be honest with you, Bismarck's big, big day. And basically what had happened was this. It divvied up Africa. The Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 divvied it up and basically said no country could get a piece of Africa until they laid claim. You have to lay some kind of legal claim. What's a legal claim? You walk somebody through it. You get one of your own explorers to go through it. So somebody for France walk through it, then you say, I claim this for France. By the way, they're not asking the people who live there. So there has to be some legitimate claim. And so if somebody from England walked through there exploring for England, they lay claim. And what, so everyone got that. Because everyone got You had to lay claim for it at the Berlin Conference. This goes back to Leopold. And part number two. Number two. They banned the slave trade. So they're going to take the stand of stopping the horrific slave trade. Much of the slave trade was now going to the Middle East. Now that didn't mean they're going to, in essence, enslave the people who live there. They're just not going to call it slavery. The idea was this will avoid the wars that seem to happen for empire. Well, part of the deal was this. Leopold went to this conference and said, you know, the Congo is going to be rich. The Congo will be an area of conflict. Let me govern it. Did everyone catch that? Leopold convinced the other people he will govern it. And therefore, assure the three seats. I won't be there for personal greed. I will be there because I want to spread commerce, civilization, and Christianity. So, after the Berlin Conference, scroll up a little bit. How did I get here? I do something totally wrong. But Germany, we have a war, Zulu war. You gotta admit that's awesome. That is just truly awesome. I don't know what I did, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? I get nothing. Please look at me. Revolution, is it coming? What was created, and you can't see it because I covered it up for reasons I can't explain. Write down the Congo Free State. The Congo Free State became the personal property of King Leopold II. Eventually, Belgium's going to take it over, and that's going to become Belgian Congo until 1960. But the Congo Free State, now to catch that word, free, implying it's going to be a model state to show the advantages of European culture. It will fit in with the exact idea of social Darwinism that the people who proposed it wanted. We will civilize them. Oh, sure. They're like little children. They're, they're not ready to govern themselves, but we will show them. In reality, it showed what social Darwinism really meant. What happened at the Congo Free State? At first, they set up trading posts. And what they did is they set up treaties, fake treaties with anybody they could find. 
basically treaties that say we have ownership, we control, and then this. Leopold sent in people to these trading posts, and their job was to get as much ivory as humanly possible. And they began to, what they did to get ivory is going to be one of the greatest crimes against humanity ever. Heck, Stanley would be responsible for building a railroad that avoided the cataracts and the delta so they could get to the get to the main part of the river. And it's estimated up to 50,000 Africans were tortured to death making that railroad. And that is just the beginning. They would use torture, extortion to get as much ivory as possible. This is going to be a great elephant killing spree where hundreds of thousands of elephants are going to be killed because it if the native population of the Congo did not return return uh, enough ivory. This is an example of what's going to happen here. They call them slaves, but they weren't technically slaves. But if you would not bring enough ivory, you would be whipped within an inch of your life. You would be tortured. Body parts would be cut off or cut off from your family members to make sure you bring back that ivory. This became one of the greatest um, crimes against humanity in history, all from Leopold's example of the phone ringing. When the phone rings, all things must stop. I'm sure there's somebody upstairs thinking, all right, I don't care what they're doing in their classroom. This phone call is important. It's a wireless call. Thank you. Your request has been recorded. I accidentally pushed the do not ring, so it was ringing. And then after Ivory, after the elephant population basically declined to nothing, what do they want next? I already told you yesterday. What's the big thing? Okay, palm oil was the first one, the big thing for manufacturing now. Rubber. And that is when it became unbelievable. Rubber production would be they would give people a quota, and if they did not return that quota, they would basically own their families, turn them into indentured servants, and then this became the norm. If you did not return the quota, they cut your hand off, cut your foot off. These are people holding hands that they cut off for their Dutch trade. I'm sorry, their, their Belgian traders, and this was all for King Leopold, and they they basically gouged every cent out of the Congo to bring back. Now, for years, for over a decade, King Leopold was still seen as this great civilizer, and then a few people were able to get into the Congo and report what was really happening, the slaughter. The murder, the extortion. This was unbelievable. Here are more workers in the Congo. This was taken after the fact to show what Leopold had done. Here, so it was children with one or two hands cut off. I know what you're thinking. Well, then how would they get the rubber? Remember, this is tear. So if I do it to one person, that's telling everybody else. If you don't get it, what's going to happen to you? The Congo has never recovered from you combine the slave trade to what Leopold did. The Congo still, it's that like perpetual civil war there now. It's this massive country, and it's got savannah in the south, jungle, and then along the Congo River, so it's got three really big sections, and it is chaos. And it stems from this just coming in and gouging. This is what the reality of social Darwinistic thought. Because what did King Leopold think? How did he justify it when he became, when it got out there? I'm supposed to do it, aren't I? They're not really my guts, are they? They're inferior. Why can't I treat them like this? Did everyone catch that? He would, social Darwinism, in a way, would just that first that garbage about the three C's, and then social Darwinism, this is what we have to get down. Social Darwinism would justify the treatment of the Africans. This is some of the cartoons that will come out when Leopold, when it became known, this is one of him 
with all the money from rubber and ivory. And here's whipping of Africans. And this is one of the famous ones. I love this cartoon. Yeah, it's, it's a really good one. Here is, it's supposed to represent the Congo and the snake of rubber squeezing it to death. And you notice the face is King Leopold, who had the great beard. In 1810, I'm sorry, 1910, Belgium would finally take it away from King Leopold, a very old King Leopold. And it would become a Belgian colony. It got better. But getting better is like saying different degrees of awful. Belgium would treat the Congo as a source of wealth. So finally, Congo would revolt in, 18, in 1960. And the U.S. would get involved. It was a, a badly as it would turn out. And so that's this. But we jumped the gun because we skipped something. But everybody write down Egypt. Congo was the first big one. But let's get back to Egypt. Because Egypt <coughs> would be one of the most important. Before we get to this. Egypt. Belgium would come to Congo. We mentioned that. Egypt, though, would be what everybody would follow, 1883. And this goes back for years. A fight between Disraeli and Gladstone. Remember these two guys? Gladstone was the liberal who wanted small England, little England, who didn't want colonies. Disraeli the conservative. Disraeli wanted colonial expansion. And this would be the fight. Egypt would be the center of the fight. And it would be over this, the Suez Canal. Now, the Suez Canal was constructed actually by mostly the French, but also the English. But the Suez Canal, the British realized right away, this is a crucial point for their colonies in India. And so Britain began to intrigue almost immediately in Egypt so they could get a significant control over the Suez Canal. They owned shares in it, but they wanted more. They wanted government in Egypt that will make sure that the Suez Canal will be protected to protect India. Now, you notice I didn't mention the French. The French also were intriguing there, but the French had just been defeated by, by what is now Germany. They had to pay the big indemnities. So Britain realizes we have the advantage over the French right now. So what happened was this. In going back in history just a little bit, in 1849, in Egypt, a Turkish general basically made Egypt into a quasi-independent country. His name, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali would do this. Yes, later, an American boxer by the name of Cassius Clay, when he converted to Islam, would take the same name. Muhammad Ali. It's not the same guy. He'd be quite old. Well, once he did this, what happened was, how do countries borrow money again? They issue what? Do you remember what that is? Countries issue what when they borrow money? Yeah, bonds. Muhammad Ali issued bonds. Who bought them? The Bank of England. And once that happened, Britain had their hold via debt on this quasi-independent country of India. Now, this goes back to 1849, but by the 1870s, when the Suez Canal is being built, Britain is intriguing in Egypt, and that is going to lead into 1883. What happened was, they claimed, after Ali died, Egypt was weak, their government was not going to be strong enough to pay back their debts, and control the canal, and in 1883, and that's why we put that here, Britain declared Egypt a protectorate. Now, I mentioned what a protectorate was before. 
Egypt is still technically independent. But Britain controls their economics or their economic policy. Britain controls their foreign affairs. How do they do this? Out of debt. Once they had those bonds, they controlled, they controlled Egypt because Egypt could not pay back their debt. Egypt would remain a, a protectorate of Great Britain until 1954. Until 1954. So Egypt is going to be technically independent. It's actually technically going to be part of the Ottoman Empire until 1918. Technically, until the Ottoman Empire collapses. But Britain controls it. Now, in 1884, the Egyptians tried to fight back. And a British army mowed them down. Mowed them down. Remember technology and military. What is this? What is the massive gun? The first machine gun. The British had a machine gun. The British also had rapid fire artillery, but the big thing was machine guns. And that mowed down the Egyptians who were still using flintlock muskets. The British brought number 10 to 1, the technology. And this is going to set the stage. You get somebody in debt, you take over their government, and if they resist, you use technology. Use technology to slaughter. So it didn't require that many British soldiers, did it? All it required, machine guns. So this is going to lead to a general expansion into Africa. You notice this is 1883. This would be confirmed, therefore, in the Conference of Berlin. So let's go to 1884. What happened was Egypt, well, I'm sorry, both Britain and France then began to want the Sudan. Now the Sudan is massive. It's actually many different parts. I mean, this is this is a this is savanna. This is desert. This is jungle. This is a different style of desert. I mean, it's, the Sudan is not one country. There are a couple different, many different sets of Islam, of Islam in the north. There's some bits of Christianity, and then other religions in the south. This is a country created because Britain wanted this. And here's the deal. Write down the Sudan and the source of the Nile. Once Egypt got, or once Britain got Egypt, they were terrified that the French would march in here get the source of the Nile River, build a dam, divert the Nile to the Red Sea, and Egypt will die and Britain will be left out. Now this is patently ridiculous, but they were convinced they were gonna do this. And so Britain tried to set up a protectorate of the Sudan. Where? Right here in the capital of this made up country, they created a protectorate at in the Sudan called Khartoum. Khartoum. They even put a general there. Who do they put? One of the more famous ones, actually from the Opium Wars. General China. He was called China Gordon, Charles Gordon. He didn't get eventually the name Pasha, which means like leader or viceroy. That was a British general. He would be in charge of this. He would be the advisor to this protectorate here. They tried to do the same thing. Well, what happened was in northern Sudan, there was an uprising against this protectorate. Actually, it's really weird. It's a protectorate of Egypt, which is a protectorate of Britain. So Britain could claim, we're not colonizing, we're civilizing. There was an uprising in 1884-1885, an Islamic uprising by Muhammad Ahmad, who was simply called the Mahad. And these were Sunni Muslims to drive out the invaders, and they were led by these, these men who would go into this kind of a religious fervor. They called them dervishes, dervishes, 
where they would spin and chant and yell. And in 1885, they defeated China Gordon's army. It was called China Bear, and that's a horrible name, but that's what I remember him as from when I, my teacher. The British and their protector were driven out, and the Mahdi destroyed them. And for a short time, they lost the protectorate of the Sudan. The reason why I put down Gladstone is Gladstone was prime minister. Gladstone did not want colonization, but he could not handle the humiliation of Gordon being defeated. So what happened was this. The British felt they had no choice but to organize a large army, march down the Nile, and defeat them. And this is going to be one of the biggest victories in history. It's going to be called Onderon. Onderon is going to be 14 years later. The British under Lord Horatio Kitchener, who is going to be their most famous military officer going into the 20th century, would go down with cavalry, rapid fire artillery, and machine guns and wipe out the Mahdi rebellion. Look at the numbers. The story is when the Mahdi's army attacked, their cavalry attacked, a couple machine gunners on their own killed over 2,000 men. It was a slaughter. Technology. We have the Maxim gun. And the reason I mention all this at Andorom is it shows how the Europeans were able to control. Now let's get to one more thing really quick. Oh, those are that is a that's a machine gun right there, and those are British soldiers. The only problem is, well, I don't have time to get to that. That is a picture of Onderon, a famous lithograph. These were really popular. The battle wasn't quite like that, but they had enough of it. One more thing that's going to happen right after this: a French explorer. Remember the, the uh, conference of Berlin? You get a claim. A French explorer went all the way here, south of Andron, to a place called Fischota. His name was Marchand. The French built a fort on the Nile River here. And Britain and France came within inches of going to war in 1898. All we need to know is the French. His name is Marchand right here. He actually came from, when all the way up the Congo, across the jungle, it was a hell trip. And this is a shot of, here are the French at Marchand. Here are the, they're making their fort, but eventually they would be driven out. And I know the bell's about ready to ring, but... If you know the basic idea of protectorates, Berlin, the Congo Free State, let me show you one more thing real quick. You'll be fine for the DBQ. I'll get to the Zulu War and all that. This would eventually become the French colonies. And one of the big ones would be a fight for Algeria, Algeria for its trade. But you'll notice how the French would eventually get here. They tried to get to Congo. They claimed the Congo, but they would not get it. Germany, same deal as part of prestige. Tanganyika, Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia, Cameroon. Wait, wait. And even Italy would try at the end. Okay. I think we got the strap. We should be fine. If you have any questions about this, please. Coming out. Sorry, I went a little bit after the bell, but that's okay.